Hey, people are actually here. Jake, John, Josh, Leah. Say hello, say something in the chat if you want. Where you uh where are you guys uh located? Got a fun session for you guys today. Nate. What's up, dog? Nothing, man. Josh is from Northeast Oklahoma, Leah and California. All right. Wow, far and wide, these people. Yes, sir. Sorry, John, about the pens being bounced first round. I thought they were going to do a deep cup run this year. Sid's got some good years left in him. It'll be fun. Is that, a, is that basketball? <laughs> Penguins? That's not nah, hockey. No. You know Sidney Crosby. Come on now. Yeah, I do. I think he's from Ontario. He is from Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia, actually. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. All right, Tim Collins. Tim's in the house? Sure is. Oh, buddy, good <laughs> to have you. For those who don't know Tim Collins, the familiarity, he was, um, he was in our bar school. He's one of our students not so long ago. He was one of our better, keener students that we had in our course. All right, we got two minutes. Need to have one of those like morning chants. When I worked at Future Shop, we had like this corporate indoctrination, like little, little acronyms and, and morning chants to get everyone's morale up. In retrospect, it was pretty like devious mentally to a lot of people, but. Hey, they prey on people who don't have a lot going for them. So, but like you, <laughs> I guess at the time, I guess I, I guess I had nothing going for me. I was just like, Future Shop is the be all and end all of my life. I feel like you're pretty like into gaming and stuff, though. So I feel like yeah, it was it was a good job. It was fun, except I was like a little merchandising lackey. All the home theater guys would make me like go get huge rear projection TVs for them. <laughs> All right, this is almost the appointed hour, my friend. Sure is. Two seconds. Go. No. All 
right. 2 p.m. On the dot. All right. Let's hit let's get it. into Let's get into it. I'm excited. I am too. We've put, put together quite the little uh, spread here. It's great. Yeah. All right. So, hey, everybody. I'm Kyle. This is Nate. Uh, we are going to... Um, I don't get to talk, apparently. <laughs> you don't. Uh, let's just figure out our tech here. We're going to... I'm going to share my screen in a moment. But first, but first, we'd actually like to ask you all a question. Um, so we want to know where you guys are at. Uh, so I'm going to launch a poll right here. It's really simple. It's two questions. Uh, if you guys could just take a second to, um, to just answer this poll, uh, we will then get underway. I was like trying to vote and it's like host and panelists cannot vote. It's like, damn it, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> All right, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to share my little screen. Let's go to the very beginning, share it that boom sick move present present can you can you see it can you see my screen i can yeah yeah you're good so wait one second here okay i just want to make sure that uh okay i'm going to close down this poll oh oh okay cool Okay, so 40% of you are bartenders, 40% are bar managers, 20% other. Um, uh, and then 30% um, are thinking about adding cocktails, so that's interesting. So, and then 70% of you have them, love them. 9% um, have cocktails, but you don't feel like it's worth it. Um, very interesting, okay. One second here, man, Brian. Hmm, I just gotta invite somebody here, copy and bite link. All right. Okay, all right, let's hit this. Let's get it. So, welcome to this, uh, this uh, presentation on cocktail menus that sell. Uh, we're gonna keep this pretty fast paced for you guys. Um, and uh, feel free to, Nate, I think you can probably see chat. Can you see the chat and stuff? See if yeah, I, I, got, I, I got the chat. I got it open. Okay, cool. It turns out I can't really see much of anything. So, um, yeah. Perfect. But, um, all right. So, who is this training for? So, uh, this is for bar owners, bar managers, bartenders, bar consultants. Really, it's for anybody who has an interest in, um, in you know, crafting uh, cocktail menus and also maximizing the the profitability of those menus um so yeah here's an overview of what you can expect uh from this so we'll give you a brief overview of who we are uh we're going to talk about why cocktails so for those of you who are like eh, not sure they're worth it or you're thinking about adding them this should be interesting to you um a big theme of this is is kind of little hinges that swing big doors um we'll go over the menu development process uh, we'll talk. We'll talk about the top three secrets secrets we've uh, learned over the years that help bring menus to life. And if you guys stick around to the very end, we have an offer that is like really contextual to this whole thing. Um, so and 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 it's and it, it's it'll definitely be worth some of your time. And then we have a Q and A. We can shoot the breeze a little bit. Uh, and so yeah, uh, let's let's get into it. Uh, so who we are? Uh, we're Nate and Kyle. Dorks. A couple bar dorks. Um, in 2013, we met, uh, we helped open a spot in Victoria, British Columbia called Little Jumbo. Um, funny story about that. I came into Jumbo. I didn't know shit about shit. Um, they actually hired me because I, I had worked at and failed at a, at a bar in, uh, Toronto. And, uh, but I worked at that bar and, and we had liquid nitrogen and that was on my resume. And, um, pretty sure that's why I got hired. It was exactly um, why you got it. It was terrible. Yeah. So um, I actually really sucked when I started. Uh, Nate, what's your what's your favorite story to tell about like my first shift? You know it. You're just pretending like people don't know. So Kyle, first shift, uh, I'm staging this guy. It's kind of like a working interview. 
Um, and he comes behind the bar and like, it's fairly busy and I need his help, but he's busy on the other well, like making up, tr trying to make a blue blazer for a guest. Um, a blue blazer is basically like a Jerry Thomas, like, uh, you know, it's 19th century drink where you're pouring. It's pretty disgusting. It's like boiling hot scotch, like over overproof whiskey, water. Uh, it's just like a bare bone shell of a cocktail. You pour it between two stainless steel insulated mugs. And <laughs> the best part is when he, he lit it, it didn't even light. So he was just, in his apron in full garb, just like pouring liquid into a cup like an idiot. Oh man, I still, I don't let him let it live it down to this day. Anyway, it was, it was pretty funny. Not a good first impression for Mr. Gilpoil, yeah. but uh, he, but, um, but what happened is I went from being a lousy bartender and in about the span of three months, I, I got really good. And, um, and, you know, um, it just, people started, um, you know, just like saying how, how good I was. And I, I don't say that to like brag. It's just, it's more of a testament to um, the essentially the system that Nate put me through. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about why that matters in a second. But then um, from 2014 to 17, Nate and I were um, it's kind of off the races, just helping uh, Jumbo be very successful and having a lot of fun in the process. And then in 2017, we uh, founded the Nimble Bar Company. And so we founded it to um, help bar owners, operators, and bartenders just have more freedom in their skill and their day-to-day and uh, ultimately their, their uh, performance and profitability. So that's the lens, that's a filter through which we put everything that we do. And so what that looks like today is a bartender training program. Uh, we help bars with uh, measurable bar performance. Um, and then we have the Nimble Menu Syndicate, which we'll talk a bit about at the very end. So why cocktails? Little hinges swing big doors. Um, ultimately cocktails, if you look at the overall makeup of the revenue in your establishment, they drive the most revenue with the least cost. They are highly marketable assets. There is built-in intellectual property. Brand equity is raised as you create more cocktail assets, if you will. And they're uh, wonderful opportunities for uh, PR or public relations. And ultimately, at the end of the day, they're, uh, they're very fun. So did I miss anything? Anything you'd like to add about why cocktails? Well, especially now we live in the smartphone age, right, too, like Instagram, People are building the restaurant brand. I can think of like four or five good restaurants here in Victoria alone that get guests in the doors literally just from, from posting imaginative creative cocktail photos. So keep in mind, social media is a big part of kind of how we, the lens and how we market our, our businesses now. Totally. Yeah. Um, and we'll give you guys a little bit of proof uh, from uh, sales data. So um, when Nate and I were at Little Jumbo, every six weeks we would cycle in a new menu. Um, and uh, in retrospect, that was kind of a huge- It's crazy, I'm thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, but if we look at the numbers, it kind of, it kind of makes sense. So uh, this menu in uh, June of 2017 for six weeks drove uh, $31,750 in six cents in revenue. Uh, the cost of goods on that was $7,937.90, which is around 25%. Um, and, and that's an, uh, a profit of $23,813.70. Now, um, Nate, okay, I'm gonna, I don't mean to throw anyone under the, under the bus here, but we were kind of back then, we were kind of like kids in a candy shop, weren't we? Like, we weren't, we weren't really thinking, oh, like, let's make tons of profit. I think it was more like, let's do cool shit. Would you agree? Yes, year one, for sure. Um, definitely, like, you have access to all these things. Someone's running the GM role. I'm the bar manager. I get to just kind of come up and use my creative prowess. Um, at the same time, though, I was militant right from the start about all my menus averaging 25, 24, 25% cost, which is what you should be shooting for. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, but general annual average, you should be looking for 25%. That's a, that's a good drink cost. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so here are just some like, some uh, like number breakdowns uh, from uh, these menus. So you can just, you know, you can kind of begin to see, well, one Howard Carter's Canary uh, drove like a little over seven grand. And then the poorest selling one was all day breakfast at, 1,548. Um, so we can start to, we can start to um, get lessons from this. And, and part of the, part of the, what's cool here is that uh, once a year, we would run um, a menu of best sellers. So mm -hmm. that menu would ultimately become the, the heaviest revenue driver over the course of a year. And, it, and it's a practice that pretty much anybody could do. Uh, in June, 2018, uh, 37 grand in re or 38 grand in revenue uh, costs us a little uh, about 9,500 and profit 28,000 and a half whatever. Um, and then so uh, gin and tea 
uh, so here's just some more numbers. Um, it's a lot of units. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of units. Sold. I think, sorry to interrupt, I think it's important that people know that Little Jumbo, this is a 50 seat restaurant. Yeah, yeah. This is not, this is not a 200 seat massive operation. So in six weeks, 542 units, that's, that's pretty significant. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then, oops, I'm missing a menu here, but, um, but in this, in June, 2019, uh, 39, uh, grand, uh, 29 grand in profit. And so you can see a trend, uh, things are going up and to the right. Um, and again, just, just some more, uh, you can see like, uh, when you find a winner, like pink and pink up here, um, it, it can really uh, do a lot of heavy lifting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that in a second here. Um, uh, there's nothing here. Uh, yeah, so cocktails are like little profit soldiers that keep working for your bar business um, on an ongoing basis. So um, something cool. you I like this. Yeah, something you might not have noticed about these menus is um, because well, probably because we didn't highlight them, but at the very bottom here, there's Spurs and Saddles, which sold um, one thousand two hundred twenty-one dollars and sixty cents. That wasn't even on the menu. In fact, that was a cocktail that uh, Nate created in two thousand thirteen, right, Nate? Yeah, some of that. Yeah. So right at the very beginning. Um, so in 2017, that's still working for the restaurant. It's bringing in ten and a half thousand um, dollars in 2018. Again, close to ten and a half thousand dollars. So it's just like it just keeps on. It's a little soldier, just keeps trucking along. Um, and that's because, um, uh, yeah. It's so it's a, it's a cocktail that Nate created in 2013. And so clearly uh, we had a hit. And so what we decided to do is we decided to scale promotion, right? So. Um, and what that looks like is here. Here's a quick video. Of, this is the Spurs and Saddles cocktail. Okay. The Spurs and Saddles. Love the music. This is Little Jumbo's all-time best-selling signature cocktail made by our former bar manager Nathan Cottle. We're going to start by smoking a glass. Here we have a piece of charred New American oak. It's from a bourbon barrel. We're just going to get our glass smoking. Next, we're going to put in two dashes of Angostura bitters. This gives the cocktail lovely notes of winter spice, clove, cinnamon, cardamom, allspice, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. Be sure to get some of the side there. That's going to go right into our pot. Then we're going to take a bit of house made root beer syrup. So you go with half an ounce of the root beer syrup. Three quarters of an ounce of a premium triple sec like Cointreau. Kyle is our dedicated technique coach at the bar school. Bourbon. In this case, Jim Bean Black Label. Right in our pot. Then we're just gonna ice that up, give it a good shake. Take our smoked, uh, smoked glass, fine strain it. There you have it. Spurs and saddles. All right, so so we, uh, yeah, like Nate, Nate, Nate mentioned, uh, at the Nimble Bar School, I, I teach technique. I'm very influenced by Japanese. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But um, so we, we made videos like that. Uh, Nate made a logo, he sold t-shirts. We put it on mugs. Um, uh, I, I got this message, um, someone, uh, so I'll actually show you someone in, in a second, but this person said, fall of 2017, I went to Little Jumbo and had spurs and saddles. I raved about this drink to everyone when I came back to Oregon. I had the pleasure of going back to Victoria this fall and went back to Little Jumbo. I got your card when I was there before. So the point is, is it's a soldier, right? It, you know, yes, it keeps driving sales up, but it's also, it's spreading the word about the establishment. Uh, so we also, we made smoking pucks, okay? Um, we sold them across the bar. You know, we hustled these little pucks. Um, so anyways, it's just, the, the point is, is that when you find a winner, uh, you can scale it and it can work for you for a very long time. Uh, all right, now let's get into the menu development process a little bit here. So there are uh, three parts of the process. There's creation, education, and promotion. And, uh, but first we wanna ask you guys a question. And so it's time for another poll. And the question in the poll is, what do you think has the biggest impact on the ultimate success of your drink menu. I am going to see if I can go into Zoom here. Oh man, I might have to stop sharing my screen. I will stop sharing for one second. And I'm going to launch this poll. All right. So, oh, that poll's still going. It shouldn't be, but that's okay. All right. So the question is, 
Okay, poll is launched. Um, what do you guys think has the biggest impact on the ultimate success of your cocktail menus? You can pick more than one. If you think they're all equal, you can pick all of them. Creation, promotion, or education. What do you guys think? I need some Jeopardy music. No, you're you're, you're looping okay. it. <laughs> all right, okay. Give it like five more seconds. I think you're I think you're all done. All right, let's end it. Okay, so. 65% uh, uh, promotion won at 65%. Education is in second place at 59% and 29% said creation has the biggest impact. Um, and we would agree with you guys on this one uh, in a big way. So let's get into it. Let me share my, oh wait, I gotta share my screen first. Sorry about this guys, da, da, da. share, present, present. All right, so. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. Uh, most people uh, have, have heard of this, I think. Um, but for anyone who doesn't, uh, it just says that 20% of the time spent uh, has 80% of your outcome or your, your results. And 80% uh, of the time spent has the opposite effect, so 20% of your results. Okay. And when it comes to the menu development process, um, most people are belaboring the creation process. So 80% of their energy is going into creating something, um, whereas 20% is going into the education and promotion, which actually does most of the heavy lifting, okay? So um, what we're ultimately gonna help you guys do here is in, so education and promotion is, is outside of the scope of this. That, that's, that's up to you guys, um, how you wanna do it. But what we can help you with here is how you can streamline the creation process. And if you want to hear about the menu syndicate at the very end, we have a way to just take that off your hands. So um, let's, let's briefly do an overview of, of what the creation process looks like. And then we'll also do education and promotion, of course. Uh, so creation is about striking a balance. So how do you make a balanced cocktail menu? We'll be talking about this. It's also about making it a collaborative experience and assigning many different people um, tasks to lighten the load off of one person. Uh, Nate's going to talk a bit about costing and pricing. We'll talk um, very briefly about testing. Uh, we'll talk about imaginative names and descriptions and the top three secrets that we've learned to bring a menu to life. Uh, the education, this, this involves uh, training materials. It's enrolling your team. Um, it's about making exciting discoveries together. And ultimately, the more time and space is made for education, the more knowledge your team has, the higher your sales are going to be because they can connect different, you know, sort of synapses and they'll be able to come up with their own way of describing cocktails to, to drive the most sales. And then finally promotion. This is like an endless, you know, gamut. You got design, you have teaser posts, you could do brand partnerships, uh, different kinds of media, whether it's like, you know, photography or videos like you just saw with the Spurs and Saddles. Um, maybe you find a winner uh, and you, want to give it its own personality. You could give it its own following, you know, you can brand it. Um, you know, how are you going about launching your cocktail? Um, we talk, um, when we think of promotion, we also think about scarcity. That's why we continuously have a six, you know, a six week menu coming in and coming out because people know they just have a limited time to experience that menu. It's like a show um, at, the, at the movie theater or something. And then there's also an inherent power that comes uh, with new things that are new people are attracted to. So um, those are some things to think about in the promotion uh, aspect of uh, cocktail menus. So yeah, so it's a lot of shit, right? It's, um, and we're not here to overwhelm you, um, but it's more than anything, it's just to, you know, impress upon you that when it comes down to it, um, if you can, if you can just totally streamline this creation stuff or like get it off your plate so you can focus on the needle moving stuff, which is education promotion, it's gonna go a long way. Um, and I just wanna reflect back on the numbers that we showed you, you know, um, essentially an average, an average year in cocktail revenue at Little Jumbo, when Nate and I were like in the weeds, were we not, we were in the weeds, we were like, we were concepting, we were uh, testing, we were running around just 
getting everything and making it happen, we didn't really know what we were doing. And it was, you know, it was driving about 380 grand in revenue. Um, so, and that was the highest margin revenue in the establishment. So just makes you think. Um, all right. So let's just, let's get into some practical ideas that you guys can use to streamline uh, your creation process. All right, so striking a balance. Um, we, uh, we put together this sort of template and you guys, we can give you guys access to these slides if you want, but um, it's essentially uh, a plug and play model that you can use so that you ensure that you have a well-balanced menu. You know, um, you don't wanna have like everything just like easy breezy refreshing and you don't have it, you don't wanna have everything that's like super nerdy. You wanna have a healthy balance. Um, so Nate, do you wanna you wanna talk a little bit about uh, what's going on here? Yeah, so I mean, this is a pretty like dumbed down example of what we used at Jumbo, um, but we'd always be cognizant when we launched a new menu of of what gaps uh, were left from the previous menu, right? So if it's one of the big gimmicks we had uh, at Jumbo was we had a flavored ice program. So once every cocktail menu for at least the first couple of years, we would implement some kind of flavored ice, right? And that could be like watermelon cubes, that could be um, you know, chai tea cubes. It could be anything that really just kind of gave the cocktail pop. Pay no mind to the 15s all across the board because it's different now. Like the average cocktail price, I think most people uh, in this webinar would probably agree that in your city's cocktails, a good menu cocktail is going to be somewhere between, yeah, 15 and 17 now. Uh, when Kyle and I were at Jumbo, obviously it was probably 12, 12 and 13, would you say is the average market price? Uh, right. I'd say, I'd say low, like 12 is, 12 is low. I think like 13 to 15 is yeah the course yeah so these are all 15s that's not representative of what you should be doing you should have um you should have some kind of let's call them economy cocktails that are basically like an economy spirit with a cool the cool factor comes from like a syrup that's super cheap or like maybe your bartender likes you know fucking around with tinctures and bitters and has like a really cool custom bitter um the point being there's there's very easy steps to to give some like pop and some individuality to your cocktails without just spending on the priciest ingredients. Um, so we've got, we've got a whole gamut here. We've got like Collins, we have a spirit forward cocktail. Uh, we have refreshing. It's always nice to have like a tall effervescent, like a long drink as we call it. Um, you got to make the nerds happy. So we always have kind of like a couple, uh, I called them exposure drinks that really kind of, it's not posturing, but it's essentially like, I don't know, Kyle, would you say it's like way to demonstrate authority that your cocktail bar is like when people come in and look at your shit, it's like, okay, these guys are pushing the needle. They're, they're staying, staying, uh, staying yeah, trends and stuff. Or just, or just creating some intrigue. Just really, uh, yeah. Intrigue and yeah. Yeah. And, um, or, or maybe you're like a spot that does not have cocktails yet. And you, like, you don't, you know, you, you probably wouldn't want to actually go full nerd, in which case you'd probably just like leave out the full nerd one. You might even yeah. leave out the, the herbal and aromatic one. And just kind of keep it pretty simple. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the point here is that you you should kind of have this mapped out at, at a high level so that it becomes just like plug and play. Okay, you, like by no means this is not definitive, but like just the idea that you can just have things mapped out, plug and play after, and then that makes this part much easier. So you know, assign people, make this collaborative. I'm gonna we're gonna preach a couple of platitudes. Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, <laughs> if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. You know who said that? Henry Ford. So um, this means that take the onus off of one, one person. You know, it, it, it's, in our experience, it works best when it's not just one person's brainchild. Um, you know, so obviously involve your bartenders, servers, cooks, dishwashers. What about your community? What about people who are like super nerdy about cocktails? What if you just, you know, um, say across the bar, like, Hey, we got a cocktail menu coming out. Um, do you want like, do you want to, do you want to have a drink on our menu? You know, when you can include your guests in that way, it really goes a long way. So, um, costing pr plus pricing, uh, Nate, do you want to talk? Yeah, real, real simple. Uh, we're going to keep moving along, but costume pricing, the key to a good bar, like cocktail bar cost, what you should be shooting for, like I said, is between 24, 26%. Um, when we talk about margins and cocktails, it's like, it's imperative that you stay in that range. You can have, you can have cocktails that are what we call lost leaders, right? So back in the day, I would have, these would usually be the nerdy intrigue cocktails. These would be the ones that 
or maybe sometimes 18, even $20 because we're using, you know, Ardbeg or I went to a macaron shop, uh, macaron shop, macaroon, macaron, the little desserts, yeah. whatever. Um, I got them to make a custom macaron for a cocktail for a garnish and it came in cellophane and it was all really baller. Um, we don't, the restaurant doesn't make a lot of money if we sold hundreds and hundreds of units of that. We make our money off of, you know, the daiquiris, uh, the Clover Clubs, drinks that are mostly classics with a couple ounces of booze. Citrus is pretty cheap. Syrups are pretty cheap. And there's no other alcoholic liqueurs or modifiers. So yeah, that's basically the best way to illustrate that point is like, you got to have that balance of, of your margin cocktails that will be a, a net profit if you move tons of units. Um, but then you have those cocktails that you have to sacrifice that cost. Maybe they clock in around 30%, 32, but they're going to get eyes on what you're doing. People are taking pictures. Um, you're not selling a lot of them and you get that, that never underestimate people's ability slash want to posture in groups and get the expensive cocktail. So that's a good tip too. <laughs> yeah. The other thing to consider is that, you know, there's also labor costs, right? Like, and so yes. if you have, if uh, something we talk about in a bit in this section actually is, um, we'll, we'll, we'll just talk about it then, but like you just, you don't, you want to limit complexity right across the board. And actually that brings us to our first, first point of the, the top three secrets to, um, to bringing a menu to life. Uh, limit your ingredients and limit your list size. So uh, humans have this perverse tendency to add more shit. Like they, they just think that more is better. And there's actually a name for it. It's the, the, the paradox of choice. I'm sure many of you have, have heard of it, but it, it simply says that um, while we think that more choice is better, it actually causes overwhelm and anxiety and it causes people to make fewer decisions. And when we talk about... Um, you know, a cocktail menu bar, we, we want people to decide to buy as many as possible, obviously like within reason, but um, the more people can consume our menus, um, the more they're, they're, they're going to, 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 to try it because the cognitive load isn't so high, if that makes sense. It's just, you know, simple to read and simple to understand, simple and clear. Um, we also um, we use enchanting language. So we want to tap into the psyche of, of cocktails. Like, you know, there's this kind of dichotomy between powerful and elegant. You can think of Don Draper in the old fashion and, you know, James Bond in the Vesper Martini. Um, you know, there's this sort of intrigue. And so when we can bring that out in our language, um, it, it goes a long way. Same with imaginative uh, language, playful language, uh, using simple flavor descriptors. So um, just short and punchy so that people can quickly understand. And then also, um, keeping, this isn't really enchanting language, but um, try and tap into um, maybe cultural trends or social trends, because, um, you know, we live in a world of social media. And so if you can tap into that and sort of express it in a cocktail, well, that's, you know, there could be inner virality that could, you know, just lead to some, some press, which, which obviously goes a long way. Um, and then this is actually secret number three, but it's the it's the bunny hill effect. And this is not something that we knew before. Um, when we started our business, we had to learn about copywriting and, and, and stuff like this, which just helped inform how we put together menus. Um, but this is the bunny hill effect where you, you again, our mission here is to guide the eye uh, down the page uh, so that it consumes as much as possible. So that means that what you're doing is uh, there are three factors to consider with the bunny hill effect. So start with the least amount of content like here, and then also start with the lowest prices so that people aren't like kind of ooh, like scared off. I know these things seem like sort of um, hair splitting, but they're subtle, powerful psychological things that, that again, just add up. Think of all the hundreds of and thousands of eyeballs that are, are seeing your menu, right? So these things do add up. Little hinges swing big doors. Um, and then finally, maybe you don't have a menu that reads like this. So then you're going to consider the Z scan, which is just something like this. Um, research has proven that our eye scans documents uh, just like this. So up top, left to right, and then down, and then like that. And so the point here is that when you're crafting your menus, you want your most profitable, highest margin cocktails to be at those points. Yeah. That makes sense? Okay. All right. So time for one last poll here. Uh, I'm going to stop my share. Um, one final poll. Da, 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 da. Okay. We want to know how you guys are feeling about cocktail menus at this point. 
Does it sound like a lot of work? Are you excited to get started? Not sure. Where are you at? Oh, you're excited to get started. Um, oh, you're all, whoa, wow. Shit. Well, that's cool. Everyone is excited to get started. Wow. Okay, well, well, we're gonna open this up. To, we're gonna open this up to discussion. Well, that that's awesome. I, I gotta say, I wasn't, I wasn't expect. Were you expecting that? No, I, I don't know. Maybe you guys can chat to me here in the chat bar too with some answers. But like, you know, Pittsburgh and all these other, uh, all these other places. What type of bars do you run? Because like Kyle and I, our pedigree is cocktail bars, right? That's the name of the game that we sling. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of this shit's not going to matter to someone who has a, a craft beer tap house or, um, is doing simple pub offerings. But I think, um, Oh, it looks like Kelly Wilson. Sorry, Kelly had her hand up. So I'm, do you want to, do you want to ask a question, Kelly? You should probably unmute her. I think. Oh, did I, Oh, did I, Oh, wait. Oh, ask to unmute. Talking guests, talking permitted. Okay, you don't have to if you're. If okay, you're should, uh, yeah, so. Oh. oh, oh, no. I don't think she's talking. That's okay. It's okay, Kelly. Okay, okay. So Leah says, Leah says, I run a dive bar uh, and I work at a craft cocktail dinner house. Um, yeah, so dive bars, we have a couple of them in Victoria. Now this is where it gets tricky. Is it a real dive bar? Because if the washrooms are clean, it's not a real dive bar. I hate to break it to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're going to have to tailor your offerings no matter what. We have one in town that sells a lot of cheap beer, but they also have a paper plate on the menu at like, I think 13 or 14 bucks and it just destroys and it makes them a lot of money. Right. So, um, with pubs and a lot of sim simpler offerings, to kind of loop back to the point of the paradox of choice, I used to work at a hotel bar uh, in, a, in the Chateau Victoria here in Victoria called Clive's. And we were fortunate enough to get a top four hotel bar in the world during my time there with uh, one of my mentors, Sean. And our menu was too fucking big. Like that's the straight and narrow of it. Our menu was massive. Guests would sit down. Servers would come to check up on them after, you know, five, five to eight minutes. And they're just like, I don't even know where to begin because we had classics, we had tiki. We had all of our house-made cocktails with like insane steps and it was impressive. Like people from our world loved it, but to the guests, it's just way too confusing. So a big takeaway out of all this is like, keep it simple. Even for craft cocktail bars, like little jumbo, what were we, were eight, eight to 10 cocktails. That was it, right? So just pare down your offerings, make sure the thing you, you do offer is tight uh, and you, you have imaginative fun people working there because that's what's going to drive it. If you have people that don't want to be there and are just showing up, um, yeah, you, you need people who actually want to spearhead this stuff and get excited about tincturing and, and getting rhubarb that's in season. You need those people in your establishment too, but that's, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Um, totally. Okay. So, all right. Well, we have, we do have some questions and we'll hit those up. If you guys have any, any questions, anything like do, do not hesitate, put it in the Q and A and we will address those uh, in just a couple minutes. But first, um, we want to share with you, um, the the cocktail menu syndicate um now yeah so all right so the co what what the cocktail menu syndicate okay um so because most of you are really excited to get started um this might not be for you but we want your we want to know if you're interested in it it's so what if what if you didn't have to worry about creating cocktail menus at all and you could just focus on the the twenty percent that swings the biggest doors, which is education and promotion. Okay, what if like clockwork, every six weeks you received a complete cocktail menu system, just like the one that we created at Little Jumbo for like the better part of eight years? Um, it would include a menu that you get the rights to use, a menu you can essentially white label, um, or you can modify it slightly to make it entirely your own. Um, all the costing, pricing, and inventory documents you need are included in it. Um, imaginative names and descriptions are done for you. And again, you could just like make a few tweaks and essentially make it uh, your own. Um, the pricing would be recommended, but you can also just, again, whatever you want to price it at. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can just use it as a model and tweak it. Um, 
It would feature seasonal ingredients for maximum marketing possibilities and potential. And there would only be one per city. So there would be nothing competitive within your local market. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, 90 percent of people in any given local market don't know what cocktails are on whose menu um, and when you go outside of a given market it, it's it's a it's an infinitesimally i don't know what, how they say that word but it's very small um, so there there is there is virtually no competition within your um, your uh, city there would also be six holiday menus per year so for those of you who are interested in um, you know cocktail menus for events um, you know this would include uh, Christmas, like festive uh, Christmas uh, menus. Uh, it would include um, your, uh, your Valentine's menu, um, Mother's Day, et cetera, et cetera. Six of those. Or just, or just a summer tiki menu, you know? Yeah, or just a summer tiki menu. Um, so the benefits of it, no testing, no thinking, no link, liquor wasted on, you know, uh, figuring stuff out. And I know a lot of this stuff is fun, but this is really for folks who, uh, again, want to focus on the education promotion and less the creation. Uh, and minimum overhead with maximum profitability. So uh, we we came up with an investment um, that that makes sense because um, you know an average cocktail menu at Little Jumbo drove around 380 grand per year in revenue. But let's say that let's say you're like a fraction of the size of Little Jumbo, which is already a very small establishment. Let's say you're like you know 10% of the size. Let's just say. Let's say that you even drove just 30% of this revenue, which works out to be about 114 grand. Um, um, our goal with everything that we do is to at least 10x someone's investment. So 10% of 114 grand, that's like, we'll just call it four, 14 grand. Um, and so the way we came to our final pricing is we, we wanted to leave nothing to chance. So it's not 14 grand a year. We then took that and we made it 5% of that, which is just 475 bucks per month. And, and so we finally came up with this last number, no more figures, no more math, I promise. This last figure is because we, in our experience, we get the best results and the best um, partnerships with folks who just take action. So it's not even 475, but it, it's just slashed by 250 bucks and it would just be $225 per month. So that that is what it is um, to be a member of the nimble cocktail menu syndicate um, you would also get access to our slack channel where we collaborate on all this stuff um, you would actually be enrolled in the process we'd be sharing um, you know the creative process with you and you could be involved in it um, and and really this is for folks who who like i've said it many times but they they really want to focus on the the 20% that leads to the 80% of results, which is your education and your promotion. So if you if you're interested in this, there's no there's no commitment here, there's no fancy anything. You don't have to sign up for an entire year. Um, it's backed by a complete satisfactory guarantee. If you guys get a menu and you're like, this sucks, we will give you your money back, no questions asked. All you have to do is you just email me at Kyle at nimblebar.co with subject interested, and we'll just take care of the rest. So that's that's our pitch. That's our offer for you today. Um, that also brings us to the end of the presentation itself. And so now we'd like to invite you guys to ask any questions, um, uh, anything at all. So we do have a question from Matthew Hooper, who says, uh, country club bar with a pool, conservative clientele, putting tea drinks on the summer menu for the first time. Their minds are blown. OK, so it's a statement. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, Good work. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Um, Josh Mullen, uh, I work at a casino and we are mostly a volume bar. Do you have any advice on creative cocktails that can still fit into that model? Selling upper management on exclusive or unusual ingredients is difficult, although they do appreciate quality. That's a great question. Uh, Nate, do you want to have a stab at it? Yeah, that's hilarious. We literally last, before COVID, right before COVID hit, we did some work. Um, in the States in Washington with a, a big casino golf resort operation. And they had a new F&B manager who just really was up there to uproot all of the old bad habits, all the kind of dinosaurs who, you know, the, the type of employees who are like, you ask them, why, do you, why don't you have lemons and limes stocked? And they're like, well, they're the same thing, right? Those type of people are trying to get away from those employees. Um, so for a casino, yeah, I mean, a lot of those 
big operations, it can be like pulling teeth, trying to introduce new ideas and fun. But like I said, you can do little steps like, okay, you have a whiskey sour on the menu, just elevate it. You do a proper whiskey sour instead of just like, you know, some gun sour mix in a rocks glass. Um, this being said, I understand the casinos need to make a lot of money on very like shallow margins with their cocktails. They're basically giveaways to keep people gambling. I get that. But there is a market of person like myself who, when I go into a casino, I'm actually hunting out a decent cocktail. And if you had like a nice whiskey sour, maybe even, even just with some nice cherries or you do some bitters on top and do a nice little kind of a presentation that way, I would be really impressed because I, when I go to casinos, I don't expect a premium product. And it's actually insanely hard to find good cocktails in Vegas. I know that sounds fucked, but like, it's really hard to find a good classic cocktail there. Um, so that's where you start. It's literally just a couple of classics. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to put out like a foraged botanical menu. Just nail down a couple of drinks, like, you know, a good Negroni, whiskey sour, uh, do a daiquiri or something like that. And just, and make sure that your bartenders are, are, are doing it the right way. Um, I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, Kyle. Yeah, it does. And I'll, I'll add a couple of points. So, um, when it comes to casinos, like what's important, there's kind of like, oftentimes casinos, some are divey, but some are like really nice. And it kind of depends on, on what yours is. It's, um, but, but there's also something to be said about the brand, right? And it doesn't, if you can have nice cocktails with, um, you know, quality ingredients, um, it does elevate the brand of your casino um, and it will keep people staying there longer and attracted to it and it does not need to be labor intensive so for example if you went with just just a just a basic whiskey sour you could look at uh streamlining the process of how you make it by like putting for example you could pre-batch simple and lemon uh and even the whiskey you it does not need to be this labor intensive thing it can all be in one bottle if you wanted it to be uh you can use pasteurized egg whites you don't have to crack fresh um so um Every single cocktail, and this is, sorry, I'm thinking, this is also part of limit your ingredient list and limit your list size, um, because that makes it simple. And every single cocktail can be streamlined so that it, it is fast to put out. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, for the longest time, Nate and I were, you know, we, we would get pumped at Little Jumbo and we were, we were sque uh, squeezing um, a la minute, like fresh mm -hmm. squeezed juice, which most people don't do anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Josh. Um, we're, we're, right. gonna go, we're gonna go up here. We missed one right at the top here uh, from Susie saying, do you find that having an ultra premium selection is a good idea for customers with more refined palates or those that think that they do? Because there's a lot of those people out there. <laughs> um, yeah, the black Amex, but then the gray goose and crayon. Yes, 100%. Um, it's important to have some higher spend items, right? Like you don't wanna be that place where people walk in you know, the ballers walk in and they say, I want to spend money here, but I don't know how you don't want to have that problem. So I would always have, you know, behind the bar when I was running there, I'd have my Don Julio 1942, which is, it's like a premium and yeah, tequila. I'd have some, uh, I guess you can call them like posture bottles. So when people want to, uh, really spend, they have that ability. Your bar should not be curated with that as the kind of myopic stance of just like, I need more stuff and more expensive stuff. That's not correct. Some of our favorite bars that Kyle's, Kyle and I have traveled to in London, uh, San Francisco, whatever, have just been super tightly curated. Like one or two of a whiskey, one or two of a gin, but it's like you have an economy and then you have a premium and a middle. You don't need to litter your back bar with hundreds of bottles to get the respect from uh, people who are in this industry. It, it's actually the inverse. It's like, if you have a tight operation and you just nail what you do, that's more impressive in my eyes. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um... Yeah, and this coming from us who, you know, we worked at Jumbo where there were like 300 bottles in the back bar. Um, you know, we, we, we would always advise to have cur uh, curated, you know, over just tons of shit. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, I, I don't need to repeat what you said. Um, I hope that yeah, answers the question. Yeah, to answer just basically, yes, you should have one or two offerings that if people are looking to spend, you can make those people happy. Don't let it dominate your thought process, but have a couple of higher priced offerings or even higher priced cocktails. On our cocktail menus, we usually had one kind of, I called it the exposure cocktail. And it was, it was a, um, the proof was in the pudding, right? The spirits that we used were very expensive. There was a lot of cool factor that went in behind the scenes, whether it was sous vide or fat washing or a custom dehydrated garnish that took hours and hours and hours. Um, that's where you kind of like 
set the precedent, set the bar of like, okay, this is our, this is our banger, right? But it's not going to be your best seller. Nice. Uh, Doug says, consulting for a dive bar. Patrons are all a shot and beer crowd. No kitchen. Any thoughts on how to make an elevated dive menu approachable uh, to apprehensive guests? Uh, yes. Keep it really fucking simple. Um, and um, like, yeah, I would, I would just, I would just model the classics. So we actually, we actually have um, this um, workshop called the Five. Um, and it's essentially the five most important classic cocktails because similar to the 80-20, they influence most cocktails that you see on menus all over the world. And so um, what I would do is I would, I would model your cocktails off of, you know, these five and they're well-rounded as well. So um, it's one is the old fashioned. You could just have an old fashioned and you could. Um, be a good one for a dive bar for sure. Yeah, yeah. And you could just like, like tweak it slightly to make it something, uh, sort of inventive, like um, root beer syrup or sarsaparilla and sassafras, and maybe like an interesting, um, you know, maybe like some walnut bitters or something like that. Um, so then, okay, I'll just go over the five real quick. Old fashioned, um, Tom Collins, uh, Negroni, um, Sidecar, and a whiskey sour. Uh, honestly, at a dive bar, I, I wouldn't, like for where guests are apprehensive, keep it simple. Don't make them think, right? So um, just, model a menu off those five. In fact, maybe just keep like three of them exactly as they are. Don't, don't change the Tom Collins, right? Um, I mean, you can plug and play or play Mr. Potato Head as you see fit, but um, just just keep it simple. Don't, don't make them think at a dive bar. Um, just test the water with like a five cocktail straightforward menu um, that is proven over like, like a century, right? It, just those five, five, five cocktails are proven around the world. They're crowd pleasers. So, that's what I would recommend. Um, anything you'd say, Nate? No, you pretty much covered it. Uh, yeah, just think of things like if it's dive bar, people are shot in a shot in a brew type crowd. Just have whiskey, but have whiskey cocktails. Make a make a really simple, yeah, really simple old fashioned, or even a Manhattan. Don't go too far past that deck. Don't be making pesco sours or any like tropical drinks because it doesn't suit the brand, right? You got to think about like, especially too, when you're naming your cocktails. Try try and play off of your brand identity. You know what type? What's your establishment like? Is it a is it a steakhouse? Does it have some kind of international flair? Does it have some cool, uh, you know, musical reference or nerdy niche reference? Play off of those because that's what the guests want. They want cocktails that celebrate where you're at, you know? And you, I guarantee you go to any top performing cocktail bar. I don't care if it's like Singapore, London, Hong Kong, whatever. You look at that menu, ask any experienced bartender. I bet you they can chop those drinks down to like essentially classics. Once you peel away the, the layers of the onion, as they say, um at the core it's it's a negroni or it's a boulevardier or it's a this is just a spin on a tom collins that's what we do we just take things that are proven and we add our own cool factor and flair to them and the guests don't know the guests don't know that to them it's some completely new ip it's it's amazing it blows their mind but it's just a mr potato head swap of something else really and um and finally if there are best-selling spirits at that uh, dive bar uh, you could consider gradually introducing um, slightly more premium um, yep. spirit because that's just like, it's kind of like the bunny hill effect where it's just like, oh, they're already having, you know, they're already showing whiskey sales. So, you know, bringing in like, um, or like, sorry, maybe they're showing specifically bourbon sales and just bringing in like, you know, a nicer bourbon, like uh, um, Basil Hayden or, uh, or whatever, then that's just an easy like upsell, right? Just make make it easy. Um, all right, I hope that answered that. Uh, that's a great way to put it, because yeah, I've, I've literally had guests at places who are used to a certain pedigree and product literally come in and walk out because they want to spend money, but they don't know how to do it at your establishment. Don't have that problem. Make it simple for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Tim asks, where can I source small casks to experiment with barrel aging? Ooh, very nerdy. Is this, is this Tim Collins? Yes. Tim, uh, yeah. So right now, um, I've, Kyle and I had to re-up on our bourbon barrel staves to make more pucks. Uh, COVID really shut things down. It should be easing up pretty soon here as we get more people vaccinated and things start to kind of lessen. Um, I would... I would just make friends with like local distilleries, you know, go in there and just try and find um, whether it's Ken at Divine or someone 
talk to whoever the sales or marketing person is at that distillery, see if you can kind of, um, you know, arrange a private, like they order it in, they bring it in and you buy it off of them type of thing would be my best guess for, uh, for something like a quarter cask or something that might be a little bit more rare, but yeah. Yeah. You could, I, uh, you could also check, um, you're in Canada. So there's the crafty bartender. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and then there's also BYOB in Toronto, uh, BYOB cocktail emporium. Um, those would be my recommendations. And I imagine you can probably get them from cocktail kingdom too. Um, likely they get all those products from like Alibaba. Uh, uh, but that shipping right now with those, um, yeah. those sites would be like just a nightmare. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's, that's it. Um, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to, uh, to join us today. Again, if you're interested in the, the cocktail menu syndicate, or even if you just want to schedule, like if you just want to hop on a call with us or, or anything at all and talk about what you're up to, um, if you want to bounce some ideas, we're uh, like, we love this shit. So um, we're, we're more than open to that. Um, just, just send me a note at kyle at nimblebar.co. Um, if you're interested in the syndicate, just put interest in the subject line. But if you'd like to, if you'd like to schedule a call, just um, put schedule a call in the subject line and we will take care of the rest. Um, ba, 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 Kelly, Kelly says something just started. I was bartender myself in the cocktail bar that opened on the island here in Tofino. It's refreshing call for me. Actually, my partner and I will a little jumble. In the awesome, Kelly. Yeah, I definitely started from scratch. I sucked. Sucked really bad. Um, shout out, shout out to my man, Kyle. He put this all together. I just gave him some sales data and he turned it into like this nice electronic thing. So good job, Kyle. Well done. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Well, um, also, if you want the replay of this, hit us up. Um, we're, we're very approachable. Just hit me up, Kyle at nimblebar.co, Nate at nimblebar.co, whatever you want. Um, but yeah, have a great rest of your day and, uh, and yeah, see you guys soon. Cheers. See you guys. Thank you.